this is what I do, this is what I seem to be fated to go on doing, I... This is what Perry allows you to keep on doing, well, and rightfully so, Perry. He insists that I keep <laughs> on doing it. I mean, I, I, I'm at this point uh, obscenely old to be doing this, <laughs> but I went down last fall to have my faculty ID card uh, updated, and they put it in the machine, and they said, you don't need this card to be updated. Your ID is valid until 2099. <laughs> well, my God, by then, 2009 will be material for a period study. What am I to do? But they won't let me stop. And as long as they want me to do it, and as long as people like what I do, can I be the only person in the country doing this? I think you are. No, we must have people like you shaking the foundations must we? of Why? capitalism. Because artists get or actors get trapped within the demands of the moment, the demands of the edition, the demands of the television. Yeah. How do I get this? And it's like they can't get their fingers off the middle seven keys of the keyboard. And you yeah. go, hello, yeah. there's two and a half octaves that way and there's three octaves that way. Yeah. Now, unless you yeah. can play the keyboard, you're not an actor. You've glued your fingers to the middle seven keys. But Bruce Willis made a career out of three gestures, so yeah. why not? Yes, exactly. You know? All right. If that's what you're aiming for. If that's what you're aiming for, which in fact will feed your family, yeah. give you a house, uh, take care of your parents, yeah. and actually give you choice, because that's, that's the devil's hole, that unless I go there, I won't have choice as an artist. Yeah. If I go away your way, Peter, I won't have a choice. I'll be working the back rooms and the church basements. If I go Bruce Willis's way, I will make my money, then I'll have a choice. But it's the devil's hole, because once you've gone that way, you don't go back. So, which is preferable? I'm not pre prejudiced at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do give them a choice because they can, they can expand. They can, knowing more about their craft than they would if they simply went into the narrow hole, they have much greater choices. They can change the profession. What's the point of teaching them if they're not going to change the profession? Can you describe to me as an actor the changes in rhetorical acting, because I know there was rhetorical acting in Shakespeare, right? They studied rhetoric, but that is 1600, 1604, yes. 1610. Then we go through the 1660s, then we go through the 1680s, mm -hmm. then there's William Blake, and then they we're into the 18th century, and then we're into Restoration, and then we're into Baroque, and there's rhetor a rhetorical uh, skill under all of that, but it's changing, is it not? Yes. Can you describe to me those changes? So an actor can hear how Elizabethan rhetoricalism ends up as a melodramatic, a melodrama rhetoricalism in 1890. Oh dear, well, I never set up to be a theater historian as such, but essentially, uh, you're right, the, the, the kids, the, the, the boys in, in uh, their schools in the Elizabethan period were taught rhetoric, they were taught grammar, by that it meant Latin grammar and Greek grammar, and they were taught the whole uh, art of rhetoric, which is the art of presenting and winning an argument, which is why the great speeches in Shakespeare and the great scenes in Shakespeare are all built on debate. All of those characters are debating debating with the, you know, amongst themselves, debating within themselves in the middle of a monologue. Right. And those people are speaking in order to discover what it is they're thinking so that they don't know at the beginning of a long monologue how it's going to end. And it often surprises them and sometimes appalls them. Uh, they're playing for the most part outdoors, or at least in an unroofed theater. Uh, and it has to be big physical acting in order to get across to an audience, which is not necessarily sitting in reverential silence, listening to a play the way we do. The, the play houses were noisy places, people uh, chattering all the time, going 
up and down selling things and uh, calling responses back up onto the stage. It was a noisy place. And so to get your point across, it had to be big, aggressive, uh, uh, presentational acting. All that stops in 1642 when the Puritans closed down the theaters because of the, um, the threat of civil war. Then we have the period of, of um, Commonwealth, Puritan rule, no public sports or entertainments of any kind. Uh, in private homes you could still do things, but there were no public theaters. And then it all had to start again with the Restoration. Then. It, uh, it, it's, the, it's the French theater that is the main influence. Charles and his brother and the, the court had been sitting out the Commonwealth in the French court, Louis XIV, son king. And so that kind of theater was brought into the... And that's Racine? That's uh, Re yes. That's yes, yes. And, the, uh, and that is classical theater about gods and goddesses yeah. and princes yeah. in a very rhetorical style again. High, high rhetorical style. Absolutely the, the ultimate extreme from anything naturalism or contemporary. These were the, uh, they're all couched in great, great poetry. Poetry is the language of the gods. And so it was these great, high, uh, superhuman figures and issues and passions that were depicted on the stage. And actors at that time um, studied the great statues and portraits and molded their stance, their uh, whole uh, appearance on stage and their sound to those Pictures and, and this is the work standing. of Opera Atelier now in Toronto. They're that's exactly what, what he's doing. Yes, that's, that's what Marshall's, Marshall's made a, a lifelong study of that. Marshall and Jeanette together have made a lifelong study of that. And they've been down in, in Australia working, working with this man, Dean Barnett, who was their great, their great um, uh, teacher. And we're seeing this in their work. And as you know, he has occasionally done some straight theatre yep. uh, using all of that. Um, so this is 1680s, 1690s going into... 1660s, uh, right through to, to uh, I would say, up until uh, the 1690s at least. And then, of course, there's Jeremy Collier with his attack on the, th on the stage. And gradually, with the 18th century, there's a... But, sorry, was the, but is that called Baroque acting then? Uh, well, the Baroque... Uh, is is the excessive ornamentation? Yes, uh, you you see that in some of the the uh, the madly excessive costumes of the of the period. There's some pictures of Thomas Bettinger and so on in in in, in, in enormously fanciful costumes with it's supposed to be a Roman soldier and he's wearing a, like a tutu <laughs> sticking straight out from you know from from his from his waist and, and uh, huge uh, uh, helmets that no soldier could ever possibly have worn with plumes going up yards and yards. And, uh, uh, and what's the impetus the behind that Baroque excessiveness? It's, it's to make it as strange, as arcane as possible, to get as far away from what is ordinary and everyday to go and be amazed in this fantasy world. And that's what the, what the poetry was, and the gestures, and the, the whole thing had to be far, far huger than mere mortal life. And that was thrilling, and they put enormous amounts of, of funding into that. And we're talking mainly French theater now, 1660, 1680, 1690. Some of this came and the across influence, to Britain. And the influence of that French theater on, on the English theater. And so this is Dryden? Dryden, uh, Nathaniel Lee, Elkanah Settle, uh, John Crown, a whole number of those people. And we, I do those plays uh, in this 
this golem that I have raised. 